So I want to continue talking today around the idea of family. It's our week three of our series, Family Matters. And I really felt led not to talk about family as it pertains to our homes, but more as it relates to our church home and the family of God that he's called us to be. And so when I was thinking about the trip, and whenever we take a trip like what we took, it, you can't help but have your eyes open to the reality of the gospel message of who Jesus is and what he wants to do, but also like the smallness the little part that we play, you know, because it's such an amazing big world that most of us never get to see the outside of it. So we don't realize there's thousands and thousands of people out there who either really know God and really love God or don't know him at all. But it was God's intention all along through creation to have a family and his own special people to have intimate relations, relationships and connections with us. And it started with the Israelites. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a preview on, on how I'm going to share this today. So we're going to go through the Bible, and I'm going to give you a lot of Scripture. Now, those of you that have heard me teach before, you're thinking you know what I mean. But there's more. Okay? And there's more because the Bible is amazing. And it's so cool because it fulfills itself. Okay? And so I want to show you that it's all connected, that it all goes together, that God's plan runs through the entire thing, and you'll be able to see by the time we're done what God's intention was and how he shows us that in his word. Does that sound exciting? Okay. Thank you, guys, those of you who thought it was exciting. The rest of you, just stay awake. Okay. So... The Israelites are in the Old Testament. They are God's chosen people, okay? And his plan, though, God's plan was never limited to just the Israelites. He never was like, I'm going to make a, a, a group that's only us and nobody can be involved in it. Okay, that's what it kind of seems like in the Old Testament if you read through the Old Testament. But I'm going to show you that God's plan from the very beginning was uh, to include all of us. And it started with a guy named Abram, okay? Abram was chosen by God to be the father of a nation, to be the father of his people. The only problem was Abram didn't have any kids, and he was super, super old. But God came to him, and he cut a covenant with him. That word covenant means an oath or a promise. And he promised Abram that he would have a son. And in his old age, this son would be his heir, an heir to the promise, okay? After years and years of waiting, because God always, like, tells you the promise and then makes you wait on it. I don't know why he does it. I wish that he wouldn't, but he just, that's just how he does it, okay? And so after years and years of waiting, Abram and his very old wife, Sarah, finally gave birth to a son named Isaac. This was the son of promise. And then something crazy happens. Everybody say crazy. It was crazy. In Genesis 22, God tells Abram, who by now God had changed his name. He'd spoken even more blessing over him. His name is now Abraham. And he tells him, go and sacrifice your son. And he didn't mean like offer him to serve at the church once a week. He was talking about like sacrifice him. Like, you know, Dunzo. No explanation. Abraham didn't have the opportunity to ask any questions that we know of, but Abraham obeyed. He was like, okay, God told me to do it, and I'm going to be obedient to God. This was radical obedience, and Abraham could only do this because he knew the voice of God, and more than that, he knew God's character. He knew that God was good. He was intimately acquainted with God. The Bible says that they were friends. The Bible only says that about a few people. And this was one of them. Abraham and God were friends. So Abraham trusted, even though he didn't understand that God had a plan that he couldn't see. And this is actually, in Hebrews 11, it gives us a little bit of insight to what was going on. It says, 11, 19, it says, Abraham re reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did re receive his son back from the dead. Abraham knew that because Isaac was a covenant promise and God cannot go back on what he promised through covenant, okay, I'm gonna, we're going to explain more of that in a minute, that this, was, this bound God to that promise. And so Abraham trusted. He said, hey, you made a covenant promise to me. You're bound to it. It's an act made through blood, shed, and sacrifice. I want, you to, I want to explain what covenant looked like during this time. So God came to Abraham and he said, Abraham, I'd like to make a covenant with you. And Abraham said, okay, great. And he said, go get some animals. So Abraham goes and gets some animals. And then it's like a bloodbath. And Abraham cuts them all in half like cow. You see what I'm saying? I want you guys to visualize this. I'm going somewhere, okay? Blood everywhere, okay? 
This is how they did it in the Old Testament, okay? So then God walks through the blood and the animals, and then Abraham walks through the blood and the animals, and they, they had cut covenant. What is significant about that is that cow, it couldn't be put back together, right? There's no undoing the covenant. It, once it's done, it's done. And so God was bound to that covenant. That's how significant covenant is, okay? If you have a weak stomach, I apologize. That's just in the Bible, okay? So we get to this point in Genesis 22 where Abraham is about to kill Isaac on the altar, and all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord shows up to stop him. And this is what God speaks to his friend Abraham. But right before verse 15 that I'm going to read, God reveals himself to his friend Abraham in a new way. And when you obey God the way that Abraham obeyed God, God will reveal himself to you in a new way. He will reveal a new level of his character and a new dynamic of who he is. When we walk that closely with him, he wants to show us his character. This is the very first time that we see God call himself Jehovah Jireh in Genesis 22, right before this. He provided something for Abraham so that Abraham didn't have to kill Isaac. In Genesis 22, 15, it says this, the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies and through your descendants, all, everybody say all, all. the nations of the earth will be blessed all because you have obeyed me. Now, I know that you must be thinking, what in the world does this have to do with me? So we're going to jump to the New Testament, okay? But this verse in Genesis is giving us the promise that Abraham's descendants, through them, all of the nations would be blessed. This is talking about his most famous descendant, which is someone you might have heard of named Jesus. Jesus was a descendant of Abraham. And this verse right here is, foreshadowing that God's plan is not just for the Israelites, but it's for everybody gets to be included in what his plan from the very beginning was to bring all mankind back to himself. So we're going to jump to the New Testament and we're going to be in Ephesians 2 in just a few minutes. Okay, so you can turn there if you have a Bible. Um, We're going to read a little bit of scripture. Uh, So God's plan all along was to send Jesus to make a way for everybody to be included, okay? God created each of us for intimate connection to the heart of our Father, to be a part of the family of God through salvation. That was the plan from the very beginning. Sometimes I think we think, well, Adam really messed up. God's plan was Adam, and then he messed up, so God had to come up with plan B. Jesus was never plan B. Jesus was always plan A. The plan was always for all of us to be reunited with our Father in heaven, okay? And I love how the Bible shows us later what was going on all along. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it says this. This is God's plan for salvation. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he had planned for us long ago. A couple things that I want to point out here about God's covenant plan for his, fa- his family is, number one, he gives good gifts to his kids. I love that it says salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done because so often we think that it's something we can earn. We think that if our good outweighs our bad, then we'll be good to go when it comes time to meet, meet, meet God. But salvation is not something you can earn by doing good things. It's not something you can earn by coming to church. It's not something you can earn even by, by tithing or, or serving or doing, doing any of the things. Salvation is a free gift that has absolutely nothing to do with you. The only thing that you're required to do is receive it is to realize it's a gift of grace that God gives us. And what is salvation? It's the forgiveness of our sins. It's the release of that sin so that God looks on us with love and compassion because of Jesus. It's not a reward for the good things you have done. It's a heart posture of openness to our Father in heaven. It's saying, God, I need you. I want to surrender my life to you. I want to be led by you every single day. 
That's the good gifts. The good gift, the promise that God gave Abraham, it was eternity. It was eternal life. It was getting to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. That was the gift. It wasn't new car, new house, new family, all the things. The gift that God gave us, the the promise that he spoke to Abraham was eternal life. And that was one thing on the missions trip that was so inspiring to me is they live with that eternal view. That's the most important thing. That's the main thing. They don't get caught up in all of the other things because you know what? Very honestly, they don't have anything. They don't have anything, but they still find peace and they still found joy in Jesus because they had that eternal view. The second thing that God has plans for each of us is this. He has good plans for each of us. The second covenant plan that he has for his family is he has good plans for each of us. He created us in Jesus so that we can do the good things he had planned for us long ago. I want to say this. Who is included in we? Raise your hand. If you're included in we, we should have all of our hands up. We should. So many of us read the Bible and we think that's nice for them, don't we? We think, oh, God had good things planned for us long ago, thinking it's talking about the church at Ephesus or Paul is talking about that. But this was written for us to know that God has good plans for you and good plans for me. It wasn't limited to just the people who were reading this letter, but God has good plans for each and every one of us, plans to prosper us, plans to uh, encourage us, plans for peace, plans for joy, plans to uh, lead us and guide us. When he created you, he created you on purpose. You were not an accident. You you haven't lived so much in your past that you can't receive this gift of salvation and then experience the plan that God has for you. I said it last week. God's giftedness and his calling on your life, it can't be taken away. So no matter how old you are, no matter what you've done, the plans that God has for you are good and they are still available to you today. So we're going to keep reading in Ephesians 2, and I want you to really lean in, okay? We're going to read a lot, but these few verses are life-changing. And if you can let them get in your heart, this is an explanation of God's plan. He's like laying it out really, really clearly. Colossians says that the mystery of the gospel, okay? How many of us would like to know the mystery of the gospel? Sometimes the gospel seems very mysterious, doesn't it? It's like when I read my Bible, I'm like, what? What? You know, I mean, but it says in Colossians, it says the mystery of the gospel is Christ in you. That's the whole plan, that Jesus would die, send the Holy Spirit, so that he could be alive on the inside of me, so that we could continue to live for eternity. The mystery of the gospel, that's what Ephesians 2 is talking about. We're going to start in verse 11. It says this, don't forget that you Gentiles, okay, Gentiles means anybody that's not Jewish, okay? So I think that's probably everybody in the room, okay? So this is talking about us. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision. Their circumcision represented the, them as being a part of the covenant, okay? So that's what this is talking about. They, that was the sign that they were a part of the covenant. Even though it affected only your bodies and not your heart. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises that God had made to them. Now you understand what that means, what it's talking about. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Jesus Christ. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. There's so many things I want to say, but I got to keep reading. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulation when you had to earn your right to be part of God's family. In the Old Testament, right, there was laws, there was regulations. They couldn't say salvation is a free gift. They had to earn it by sacrifices and obeying the law. But now that that system of law has been ended, he made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. 
He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles, are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. One thing I want to say, verse 22 says, through him, you Gentiles are also being made as a part of this dwelling. And earlier it says that we're made right by the blood of Jesus, doesn't it? So I want you to think back to that picture I told you about sacrifice. What happened? A body was broken and blood was shed. It was the covenant. Then what happened to Jesus? His body was broken and blood was shed. And in John 10, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except what? Through. God and Abraham walked through that place of bloodshed. They walked through those sacrificial animals. And Jesus saying you can't get to God except through the sacrifice that was made on the Christ on the cross through the blood that was shed through the body that was broken that aligns our life to God because of what Jesus did because Jesus paid that price for us we have access to every promise that God made We have access to every single thing that the Bible talks about, every promise, every covenant. We are a part of a new covenant where we don't have to do all the laws and all the regulations and all the things. We just have to believe that Jesus was the once and for all sacrifice, that he was the way, that he was the truth, that he was the life, and we can walk through him and get to God. What an amazing picture that is. I hope now you have an image in your mind of what Jesus did for us. And now when you read the Bible and it talks about the new covenant, that's what that is. It's the walking through. It's the passing between those pieces of flesh that had died so that we had access to a new and lasting covenant. The last thing that we have in God's covenant plan for us is he made a place for each of us. We are all members of God's family, united by the Holy Spirit, first with him and then with one another. One of the things we realized in Nicaragua was how easy it was to share the gospel, how easy it was to pray with people. And sure, we were on a missions trip, so that was the goal, right? But God created a way for all of us to have a place that belongs. I love in that verse in Ephesians 2, it talks about we were once people who were far away, but now we are people who have hope. And it's that hope in eternity that should spark us to be excited about what God did. When we understand that God's plan was to give us hope, we should be passionate about sharing the gospel. When it's something changes your life, you want to share it with everybody, don't you? Like if you find a good deal, you're telling everybody about it. Pastor Matt is the king of telling everybody about everything that he's excited about. True? One thing he's really always excited about is his haircuts. I don't know why, he loves the barbershop, okay? So if he sees somebody that looks like they need a haircut, he'll go up to him and say, hey, you need to go see my barber, right? You need need to go see my barber. He wears the merch from the barbershop. He tells everybody, if anybody's like, hey, I like your hair, he'll be like, go to Straight Edge. That's where I go. I'm excited about my barber. He tells everybody, he could sell anything. We go to shoe stores and he say, don't buy that. Those shoes are the worst. You need to get these. And I'm like, babe, let them buy their shoes. And he's like, they'll regret it. <laughs> so I just go sit down while he earns commission selling uh, Ultra Boost. I think we should get a, like a side gig as shoe salesman because he's passionate about it. And when we're passionate about something, what do we do? We tell people about it. We want everybody to know because we're excited about it. And I think part of our problem today is that we just haven't been excited about what Jesus did for us. We've lost sight of it. It's gotten dull. We've gotten familiar with it. And it hasn't changed our life. And so we don't tell anybody about it. It should never, ever, ever be easier for us to tell people about Jesus who does, they don't speak our language than it is for us to tell our friends and our family. 
why would it ever be easier for me to communicate with somebody who speaks Spanish about the, the life-giving power of Jesus than it is for me to share with my family and with my friends, with the people I work with? If we're passionate about Jesus, we should be telling everybody about it because it's an eternal matter. When we get an understanding that it matters for eternity, that if they don't hear it, if they don't receive it, their life, it ends with darkness and despair. But if I tell them and I share, then they can have eternal life with God. The way that we were called to live because of the new and covenant promise, we can tell people there's a place where you belong. There's a place where you fit. There's a place where there's hope and there's peace and you can be restored. You don't have to be isolated. You don't have to be alone. That's a lie. God cut covenant with Abraham in Genesis 22 with you in mind, with your neighbor in mind. This promise sets a precedent for us that God was faithful to keep his promise. When we understand covenant, we can understand that God will keep his promise. Hebrews 10, 23 and 25 says that God can be trusted to keep his promise. How do we know that? Because he sent Jesus. Even when it was hard to send his son, his only son, as a sacrifice. Even when Jesus said, if there's any other way, man, let's do that. And God said, it's got to be this way. Because he saw us. He's a covenant God. He's faithful. He's faithful. How much more faithful will he be to follow through on his promises? The promises that are found in his word. We know he can be trusted because he sent Jesus. Because he did it. He was faithful to it. So when you read your Bible and there's a promise in there and you're like, man, that sounds good. It's for you. When we learn these covenant names, those, the, the names of God, they're covenant names, which means that God, that is who he is. It can't be undone. Jehovah Jireh is who he is. He is your provider. That's a promise that you can receive. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is your healer. He is your banner. He's Jehovah Nisi. He's the one that's the all-powerful creator God. He is Elohim. That means that anything in your life that's dead, he can bring it back to life. He can restore everything that the enemy's stolen. He can go to bat for you. He can protect you. He is for you, not against you. Those are promises that we have access to because he's a covenant God. God looked throughout all the years and all the creations, and he put eternity in the heart of every man. Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us that eternity was placed in our hearts. That means there's a longing and a desire for each of us to be returned to the heart of our Father. So how does this translate into your day-to-day -day life? We make a switch from living for people, confused and isolated, trying to please people, which is exhausting. All of my fellow people pleasers can understand. It is exhausting living for people, isn't it? When we understand that we are a part of a covenant promise, we are sons and daughters of the Most High God, and we live to please Him. That means the decisions that we make, they're to please Him. That means that the obedience that we walk in, it's only to please Him. We are free from the bondage of pleasing people. You know what happens when you please people? You end up doing things you don't want to do. You end up frustrated. You end up uncomfortable. You end up disappointed. When we live to please God, there's peace and there's joy in that. We live with purpose and intention, knowing that the God that created us wants to fulfill his plans through us. This new covenant that Jesus brought with him built a temple and invited us in to be a part of the family. It's a free gift for each of us. We can walk in the promise of this covenant.